Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Philippians chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through 11. If you have your iPhone or device with you, you can open up to you version. Live events. They'll be there under Parkview Assembly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, we're back online. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Paul speaking, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaking to the church in Philippi as he may be speaking to us today. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of the dogs, of the evil workers. Beware of mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Although I also may have confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks, anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised on the eighth day, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness, which is by the law, absolutely blameless. Verse 7, Paul shifts gears. Listen what he says now. But what things were gained to me, I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and what Paul, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which comes from myself, but or which is from the law, but which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Why, Paul? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means that I might obtain the resurrection of the dead. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. It is powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword. I pray, Lord, today you would edify us, build us up, heal us, make us whole. Allow us, Lord, to know your ways, a deeper walk with you, as we just, Lord, give you preeminence and priority in our hearts and minds. Be with us today, I pray, as a church family, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I titled today's message, The Joy of Contentment. The Joy of Contentment. We've talked about the book of Philippians so far. And we've started off in Philippians chapter 1. And we talked about two different items. The joy of adversity and then the joy of integrity. Uh, Paul was speaking about how he could still have joy when he was going through all of these different things. And he can have joy uh, when he had to be all he had to be in Christ Jesus. He wasn't one way one day, one way the other way. He said, I have integrity. I'm going to be the same way in Christ all of the time. We got to Philippians chapter 2. And Paul began to tell us about uh, there's joy in unity. And there's joy in discipline. And we spoke last week about having the spiritual disciplines in our life that enable us to grow. And if you don't know it or not, folks, uh, we're all on this journey called life. And it's a lot nicer if you have joy on the journey. Amen? Joy makes the journey a little bit easier. Uh, joy is the reason that keeps you going. Joy is different than happiness, though. Happiness could be based on circumstances. I'm happy because the Eagles won. Well, that's fleeting until the following Sunday. But the joy of the Lord is, is a fruit of the Spirit, which is in you regardless of whether the, if you're a giant fan like me, one in six, there's nothing to be happy about. But the happiness is based on a circumstance, but the joy of the Lord is the inner work of the Holy Spirit. And it's not fleeting, it's not here one day, gone the next. Hopefully, there'll be times on the journey when we're not happy, but we could still have joy. Amen? He starts out by saying, rejoice in the Lord. 
Paul, you're in jail. Rejoice, I say again, rejoice. Uh, there, there are always, uh, does that mean we're always going to be happy, happy, happy? Who, who likes Duck Dynasty? I mean, I, lo I love Phil Robinson, right? He gets on, he says, oh, happy, happy, happy. Uh, life isn't always going to be happy, 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 amen? There's going to be trials and tribulations, uh, always being up and optimistic and no cloudy days. Paul writes to the Christians in the church in Philippi and tells them, listen, rejoice. How would you like to be in my shoes? Paul was saying on this journey, there'll be many things that will try and steal your joy. In chapter 1, he talked about joy stealers being circumstances, problems, difficulties, hard times that can steal your joy if you allow it. Right? And then, then he went on in chapter 2 uh, to talk about joy stealers being people. How people, unity, we talked about how people can steal your joy. Amen? People just have the tendency to EGR, extra grace required. Right? And, and, but we allow them to steal our joy. Now in Philippians chapter 3, Paul deals with another item that rises to steal our joy. And it's possessions, things, stuff, home, car, money, electronics. Come on. If we're not careful, that can steal our joy also. In America, we have to be careful that we don't base our happiness on how much stuff we could possess. Base our happiness on the size of our home, the quality of our job. Or the things that we possess. The more stuff you have, then the more happy I'll be. And if you do not have the things, uh, you'll not be happy. That's a fallacy. How easy is it for the devil to steal our joy? Uh, does the stuff own us or do we own the stuff? In Philippians chapter 3, Paul starts to deal with his past. And how many of us uh, have to look at our past? I put out a thing on Facebook that it's unhealthy to live in the past. When I teach my daughter to drive, I don't teach her to look in the rearview mirror the whole time, right? Because you'll never see what's in front of you. But she glances, you teach them to glance in the rearview, but don't live in the rearview, amen? Amen. It's, it's, it's nice to honor the past and to remember it, but you can't live there. It's not healthy, folks. And we all have made mistakes, and we look to our past regrets and bad choices and failure. And Paul reminds us in the beginning of Philippians 3 that he had a past. He was a sinner. He hated life. He hated people. He hated Jesus. He hated the church. But he had an encounter with Christ in Acts chapter 9 that knocked him off his horse and opened up his spiritual eyes. And he saw Jesus for who he really was. His life was changed. He had a clean start, a fresh beginning, and he had joy on his journey. He says, I lost some things, but everything I gained in Christ is no comparison to what I had and what I don't have anymore. And I'm sure they weren't, they weren't quite certain, as you read the book of Acts, they weren't quite certain of his authenticity, of his conversion. Right? They had him, I think, in the book of Acts at, at the uh, council in Jerusalem, and they were saying, well, that's the guy that was persecuting us. Uh, Peter, are you sure this guy's not deep state? You know, are you sure this guy is, uh, is all he says he is? And Peter's like, listen to his testimony. He gave his testimony. He said, he's on our side now. Who? Praise the Lord. He was a Pharisee. He persecuted the church. Now he's on our side. Praise God. So in Philippians 1, Philippians 3, 1 through 11, Paul deals a little bit with his past. In Philippians 3, 7 through 12, he deals with his present. In Philippians 3, 17 through 21, he deals with his future. And we'll get to those in the coming weeks. But, you know, folks, why do we sweat the small stuff? Why do we allow stuff in this world to steal our joy? I was telling Denise, uh, Dane is playing volleyball now, right? And so... Uh, Look, look, sixth grade volleyball. <laughs> We're lucky if we get a serve over the net. So uh, besides that, if you get it over to get it returned, okay, not, uh, it's probably not happening. And so I said, I cannot allow this game to steal my joy. But Dania got up there. They were losing 16 to 10, and she hit nine aces in a row. So now we win in 1916. I had my joy back. But that the Lord reminded me, your joy shouldn't be, Chris, if they win or lose. And there was an old saying that's out there. It's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. Now, that's not biblical, but it, there's an example in there worth noting. 
is that the, the girls lost the first game, came back, won the second game, lost the third game, and I realized that I not only had to preach the scripture, but I got to live it. And I said, you know, it doesn't matter if they won or lose. It's, 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 we have to enjoy the journey in life. Amen? There's no reason for me to go home and watch the Giants later. I know it's not going to produce happiness. It's just not happening. I went hunting years ago, and my friend brought me hunting. And I came home, and Denise said, what did you catch? I said, a cold. She said, you don't look too happy. I said, no, it just didn't work. I caught a cold. Didn't catch anything. Better off catching rabbits in my backyard. Just didn't know what I was doing. But you can't let life steal your joy, folks. We get, don't get so wrapped up and controlled by the things of this world and allow the things of the world to steal our joy. Uh, you know, how many of these things will matter five years from now? Right? Paul talks about it in Philippians 3, 7. He says, whatever was a prophet, I now consider loss for the sake of knowing Christ. The reality is that stuff, things, money, toys, they're, they're not good or bad. They're not right or wrong. They're not holy or sinful. But good things can become bad things if we allow it. Only two points today. Point number one, I must learn to be content. Everybody say content. And I put this under there. Man, can you trust God to give you what you need in life? Can you trust God to give you exactly what you need in life? The reality is we don't own anything in this world, right? Uh, our dear friend Charlie passed away, went to the funeral on Monday, and as they took the casket out in the funeral, in the Paul Bearer's car, I realized that there was not a U-Haul truck attached driving behind him. What am I trying to tell you? We're not taking anything with us. Not even the clothes that are on our backs. Nothing comes with us, folks. We're not owners, we're just stewards. Even of our own children and grandchildren. They're with us for a time to steward. That's why Pastor Maria was saying, make sure they see Christ in you. Make sure you bring them out to Wednesday night. We're not trying to guilt you in. We're just trying to give you spiritual disciplines so your children can grow in the admonition of the Lord and enjoy the relationship that they have with you and they, that they see in you in Christ to help them stabilize when they hit those years where they're maybe looking to you know, not be stabilized in the Lord. But here in America, we love money, we love stuff, we love possessions. And, and uh, I'll tell you, my brother Bob sent me an email. He said, you got you to gotta check out this video. It was a good teaching. And, uh, I, I, you know, now I have the smart TV and you could get YouTube right on the TV, right? They're so smart. And I have all Roku and all this other stuff. So, so I go in the bedroom and I'm looking for the remote and I move the blanket and the remote control falls off the bed. Boom, bang. I said, ooh, that didn't sound good. And I went around and it was in like four pieces. And it's only like a three foot fall, two foot. And I thought, oh my goodness. So I picked up the remote. I'm trying to put it back together. I'm trying to do it. It's not working. I'm getting tape and I'm taping it up. And I'm like, it's not working. And so then I pushed the button on the side of the TV to try and get it to like HDMI 2. You know what I'm saying, right? And now it's somewhere in, in outer space. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> and it stole my joy. I'm honest with you. It stole my joy. Here I am trying to feed myself, feed some spiritual food. And I'm like, ah! But right away I went on Amazon. Got the model number, went on Amazon. Boom, it'll be here tomorrow. What's my point? The Bible says this in Hebrews 13, 5. Live your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I realize for me, do, my thing, do I have my things or do my things have me? Right? Right? What about our titles? What about our trophies? Paul had a reason. He said, if anybody had a reason to be boastful, Paul said, it's me. He said, I was a religious Pharisee. He started off. 
He said, I, I, I was proud. I was boastful. I, I had a good job. I was in the uh, Pharisees. I hung out with the Sanhedrin. This, I was in the hierarchy of the Jewish religion. I was a man of faint. He stood there while they stoned Timothy, and he held the jacket of those that were throwing the stones. He was there. He saw Timothy give, give his admonition to Christ and his overwhelming love and desire and support to Christ. Paul said in Galatians 1.14, I was advancing Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and extremely jealous for the traditions of my fathers. Yet Paul was religious, but yet he was wrong. He tried so hard to keep the Ten Commandments. That's why Jesus went to the Pharisees. He says, look at you, you brood of vipers. You're all nice on the outside. You think you keep the Ten Commandments, but on the inside, you're wicked and filled with junk. See, that's what the spirit of religion does. It wants to kill, steal, and destroy. That's how to spot a religious spirit. It's based on right and wrong and do's and don'ts. But when you're walking in a relationship with Christ and Jesus is in you and the Holy Spirit's working in you, you, you do the right thing because it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's causing you to do it. It's not based on good works. You do good works because of Christ in you. Are you getting this? That other one is called self-righteousness. He had a belly full of religion. Paul says, I was religious, but I was heading in the wrong direction. He had no relationship. He had religion. Without Christ, Paul said, it was all a waste of time. He said, I was religious, but I had no joy. Just duty, religion, going through the motions. We'll never be able to enjoy the journey if religion is our master. Joy only comes from serving Jesus as our master. Paul talked about things. He said, before Christ, I had everything. Had a great education, prestigious job, material things, well-to-do. He said, but I had no joy. After he came to Christ, he said, I gave it all up to be a tent maker. He said, but I consider it all rubbish for the, for the gain of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. He now had Christ, but pastor, he's in a prison. Paul said it didn't matter. He had happiness and joy that was unexplainable. He now had joy on the journey. Paul knew what it was like to live on both sides. Have everything the world can give and nothing the world can give. Having it easy in life and having it very hard in life. And while Paul was in prison, he writes about having joy in the journey. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, life does not consist of the abundance of things that we possess. Life does not consist of the abundance of things that we possess. Life has a way of teaching us certain lessons. I personally know that. I've encountered, as I told you, I've encountered 9-11, the tragedy there in Manhattan. Hurricane Sandy, where there was no food and no gas. In the 70s growing up, uh, when, when my family, we first purchased our new home in New Jersey, uh, when, when in the 70s when the economy wasn't so good and the gas lines, as we spoke about, odd and even number days to get gas and, and God blessed us with a beautiful house. But with that blessing, uh, they didn't tell us about the property tax in New Jersey. <laughs> They're up to $12,000 a year now. And, you know, you got to fill the tank up with oil. And now you need homeowner's insurance. And so, you know, things were tough for a while. And then God blessed my family, my mom and my dad. And I had a pool in the backyard. And the neighbor and the kids would come over and we'd share the gospel with them. And we'd show them what the difference that Jesus made in our lives. And my dad and mom blessed me with a pool table in the basement. And kids used to come over and we used to watch the football games. And we used to have times, healthy, quality times together. Uh, sharing the love of Christ with the neighborhood. But I want to tell you something. The quantity of life does not mean quality in life. Listen to me, the quantity of the things I have does not give you quality in life, amen? The amount of things we own in life does not mean you will enjoy life, amen? Many people, as a, uh, someone quoted this, said, many people who have things money can buy have lost things that money cannot buy. Look at the athletes, right? We had Willie Alfonso with us here in January, the chaplain of the New York Yankees, a personal friend of mine. 
and on the Christians, on the Yankees, he, they would get $26 million contract, and their parents would call Pastor Willie up and says, I, would you please watch over them? Because you put $26 million in the hand of someone who never handled that much money before can turn into a disaster. And so all the Christians on the Yankees get together with Joe Girardi and, and Robinson Cano back in the day. And they have Bible studies and iron sharpens iron. And they stay together. They're rooted and grounded in God's word together. Amen? Movie stars, you see, California, the divorce rate, they have everything they could ever want but nothing they need. Philippians 3, 11, Paul said, I consider it all a loss. Paul says, I evaluated myself, I made an assessment, I took an inventory of myself, and he says, you know what, on that journey called life, I'm going to have to take continual inventory and continual assess my priorities and continually seek God for his purpose. Paul was religious, devout, he was self-righteous, he was obedient to the law, to the rituals, he was obedient to law but he was miserable in life. The truth is, it wasn't sin, watch this, it wasn't sin that kept Paul away from Christ, it was a belly full of religion. <laughs> he could tell you the do's and don'ts, but it wasn't in his heart, it was in his head. Too many people have head knowledge of Christ and not heart knowledge of Christ. Because when you surrender your whole heart, it is in Christ you live, move, and breathe. And it's not a, a set of do's and don'ts. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, who's living his life through you. I told you last week, when we sit in the chairs over here, we're, 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 we're growing in Christ. And we realize that Christ has died for us when we're, when we're mature and we're living a Christ-centered life. We realize that now I live my life for Christ. Look at Paul. He had to lose his religion so he could find Jesus. How many of us has to have to lose something to find Christ? Paul says in Philippians 3, the second thing, he says, my relationship with Jesus Christ comes through faith. He said, it doesn't come from the law, the Ten Commandments. He said, I tried keeping that and I was miserable. You know, you could be Christian and be a Christian and be miserable. That's why we're doing, enjoying the journey in the book of Philippians because we need to identify the things that are stealing our joy. Whether it be circumstances, whether it be people, or our past. Come on, we all have a past. We all have a past. You can't live in the past and let our past... Look at Paul. Paul was a murderer. Look at Moses. He was a murderer. Look at Jonah. Look at a, a Peter. Everybody has a past. But your past doesn't determine your future in Christ. Because you could stand forgiven, washed by the blood of the Lamb, and ready for a new assignment in the blink of an eye. Oh, Pastor, you don't know about my past. I don't want to know about your past. If you're born again, it's washed. You're clean under the blood. It's a new day, a new beginning, a new life. Be all you can be in Christ Jesus. Forget about the past. The devil wants you to live in the past. But Christ wants to see us, us to see the future. Amen? When Paul got saved, he said, I, I lost some things. He said, but I gained a whole lot more. When you live your life for Christ, you are going to lose some things, right? God will begin to take some things out of your life. God will begin to deal with some areas, areas of your life. And God will begin to take some things out of our life that maybe are not for our own good. I remember when I rededicated my life to Christ in 1999. My family said, you You crazy. You're a holy roller. And they turned on me. And I was like to my spiritual father, Jerry, my family just He's like, perfect. I was like, what do you mean perfect? He says, this is what the Bible says is going to happen. I was like, I don't know about this deal. Of this contract. And he says, no, Chris, to live is, to live is for Christ. To die is gain. My family said, you're a holy roller. And I says, would you want me to go back to the person I used to be? No, 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 no. That was B.C., before Christ. I said, I'll, I'll go back. And they were like, no, no, we sort of like you this way. Yeah, this is a better version. But I'm not sure it was their version. It was Christ's version of who he wanted me to become. And I wasn't going to let my family get, into the, get in the way of what Christ was calling me to do for him. 
I had a decision to make. I said, Mom, I love you, but I'm following Jesus. I had to cut the umbilical cord to the past. That thing that keeps us tied to yesterday, that wants to have that draw and that pull on us. Paul said, I lost some things. What did you lose, Paul? He lost his reputation. He was respected by the Jewish community as a religious leader. He lost his family and friends, which I just told you what happened with me. It's okay. God will give you new friends. He lost his financial security. He was very wealthy before he came to Christ. He accepted Christ. He lost his job. He lost his security. He lost his riches. Just because you give your life to Christ doesn't mean you're going to be rich. Amen? Paul says, I lost some things, but I also gained some things that really matter in my life. Paul made a choice, and we need to make a choice, to focus on the things that we gained in our journey and not lost in our journey. How many Christians have their joy stolen because they're focusing on the things that they've lost? Focusing on the things we had to give up when we met Christ. Amen? I don't want to live like that. You know, we're going to have ups and we're going to have downs. We're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations. But I want you to know that Christ loves you and he doesn't want the enemy to steal your joy. And we are to be, worship team could come. We need to be rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus. So the enemy can't steal. No matter what flaming arrows come our way, we could be dressed in the full armor of God and know the devil is a liar and Jesus is Messiah and that he cannot steal our joy. He will try in situations and circumstances. He will try in people. And sometimes it's the people you're working with. Sometimes it's the people you're closest to. Amen? And sometimes, you know, the enemy tries to use them to get us upset and to steal our joy. And sometimes he'll use the past to try and steal our joy. I come by today to tell the church, don't lose your joy in the journey. Don't lose your joy. Folks, knowing Christ should bring the utmost contentment to your life. It should bring you inner tranquility. Th those things money cannot buy. Happiness is not based on whether the Giants win or the Eagles win or the Red Sox come from behind to defeat the Dodgers. It's not based on that. It's based on my relationship with Christ. You know why? Because we're in a season, I believe, you could play, Paul. We're in a season, I believe, where there's great oppression in the land. There's great depression. Lots of people are suffering from depression from being oppressed and you feel it come upon you like a wave like where did, like a wet blanket like I, I battle I battle as the leader of the church I battle every day with the enemy he tries to discourage me all sorts if you think you got a bullseye on your back check this one out he works overtime on some of us to try and discourage us to try and, and hurt us and try and confuse us but God says, that's, that's not from me. I, I give joy. I give the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's the fruit of having Christ in your life. So when, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible says, God will raise up a standard, a shield that will bounce, it, bounce his, his, his forces of darkness off of you. The joy of the Lord is your strength, folks. He knows if he can steal your joy, he's going to get your strength next. I want you to take some inventory. Say, Lord, what are the things the enemy's using to steal my joy? Before you leave here today, I want you to say, it is well with my soul. I've identified, yes, pastor, it's this. It's this and it's this. Or maybe it's one item. This is stealing my joy. This person is stealing my joy. And God's going to give you a strategy to come up against that thing. So you can stand firm in Christ. And there's, nothing, there's nothing sadder than when the enemy comes and robs my joy. Right? Whether it's a, a remote control or a volleyball game or something that just doesn't go according to plan. I'm here to tell you God has a plan for your life. God, and it's for good. It's not to harm you. He's called you to be the head and not the tail. He's called you to be above and not beneath. 
He's called you for, to a life of joy, a life of happiness, a life more abundantly. The devil comes to lie, to kill, to steal, destroy. Jesus said, I've come to give you life, John 10, 10, so you have life abundantly. Amen? Religion can't give you happiness, but a relationship with Christ can. Let's stand to our feet. If today you have a heavy heart, if the altar team would come forward, if you have a heavy heart today, say, Pastor, I, I've been dealing with this, dealing with something that's trying to discourage me, and, and I'm not going to let it win. I'm not going to let it steal my joy. I'm not going to let it steal my hope. I'm not going to let it steal all of those things in my life that give me joy. Folks, you got to confess with your mouth. It has to come out of here. you got to say, it is well. It is well. Amen. It is well. It is well. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give up. And I'm not going to give out. Because that's not what God would have me to do. God wants you, Philippians 3, 10 through 12, to press on, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of you. That means not giving up, not giving out, not giving in. you got to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of you. If that's you today, I want to restore your joy. I want the Holy Spirit to restore your joy. I want you to come down and sing and pray with us so you could be restored. And that, that, that heaviness will lift off you like a blanket. Amen. Come on, Nancy. Let's sing. If that's you and you need your joy back, I, I want you to come. I want you to come.